Y'all want to move in here? This is first class. This is the coach section. And you will not be receiving any services back there. Just kidding. Okay, if you would, get your Bibles. Two places tonight. I'm going to sort of continue where we were Sunday, but go on a little bit different track. By the way, that, these are my notes from Sunday. The reason they're so wrinkled up is because they were totally wrinkled up, and I recycled them just, just for a little bit. So it's not a recycled message. That's just the recycled note page. And uh, turn in your Bibles with me tonight to two places, and I want to talk a little bit about bold prayer um, from the, the standpoint of where we started on Sunday. We've been in our series from Acts chapter 4, and so if you would, uh, oops, that's my glasses up here. Start there in Acts chapter 4, and uh, we see the account here, Peter and John, of course, uh, we're going to the temple at the time of prayer, and they stopped to pray for a crippled man who was healed, and that got them in trouble as much as you would think that it wouldn't. And uh, Peter's filled with the Holy Spirit and gives his defense before this religious council that's just peppering him with questions. And he said, if we're being called to account to, for an act of kindness here to a crippled man, then, then know this, Jesus did it. But the, the, the verse before that, the line right before that says that Peter was filled with the Holy Spirit. Everybody say filled with the Holy Spirit. Okay, and so when, when the Spirit of God fills us, boldness often is the result. It, or we could say boldness is the natural response to what the Spirit of God wants to do in us. Here, here's the way I say it. Boldness flows out from what the Holy Spirit pours in. Boldness flows out from what the Holy Spirit flows in. Okay, so it wasn't uh, Peter. It wasn't just him throwing a temper tantrum. It wasn't him uh, pitching a fit. It was the Spirit of God responding through him. He does so with honor, does so with respect, does so in that way, but he's very direct as well. Uh, honors God, honors the authorities that are there, but doesn't back down at all. And so here's this boldness where he's had a heart change and, and God's doing this incredible work in him. But then uh, after they are uh, put in jail for the night and threatened further, uh, on their release, Peter and John come back to the people, verse 23 of Acts chapter 4, and they report all the things that were said to them. So they reported the threats, they reported the words, they reported the facial expressions, they reported the response of all of these religious leaders and the people didn't panic. All of them together, after they had reported all of these things, Peter and John did to the church, it says they raised their voices together in prayer. Everybody say, together in prayer. All right, and the one thing they prayed for, the first thing they prayed for was boldness. Second thing they prayed for was miracles. Okay, so, so here you think, well, if the Spirit of God has already filled Peter and he responds with boldness, and then they, his boldness amazed the religious leaders because it said they, when they saw that these guys were uneducated or ordinary men without formal training in the scriptures, they were amazed. Boldness amazes people. Boldness stands out. And so their boldness stood out. And so it wasn't just the fact that they didn't have boldness, so they asked God to make them courageous. They had boldness, and then they asked for more. Okay? You can't be selfish when it's good stuff. You can't be selfish when it's spiritual things that God wants to put in you. So, so it's not like they wanted to corner the market on boldness. They didn't say, make us more bolder than the religious guys. That, that the Spirit of God was working, and they realized that this was the outworking of what God was pouring in, so they asked for more of what God was pouring out on them. And then it says, after they prayed, the place where they were meeting was shaken. They were all filled with the Holy Spirit, and they spoke the Word of God boldly. In other words, God answered their prayer for boldness with what? Boldness. God said, okay, if you want, first of all, He gave them a sign. He shook the place where they were meeting, shook them all up, and then he answered their prayer for boldness, and he made them bold, and, and he moved them forward in this process of what God was doing in their life, 
and he started something in their midst, in that community there that continued all the way through the New Testament and all the way to the prayers of faith that we pray today. And if we join together, Jesus said where two or three of us were gathered together in his name, he was in their midst. Now, let me just ask if that would change the, the boldness of your prayer instead of asking Jesus where he's at and if you could maybe feel him a little bit and then you looked around your prayer circle and Jesus was joining hands with the person across from you. Would you, I think you'd probably stop praying and just walk over and just have a personal audience. I think it would embolden your request level a little bit. Are y'all listening to me tonight? Okay. Is this, you all know this, you're bold, you're just waiting for me to catch up. Okay. You can be bold in your amens and and responses tonight. It's going to get better, I promise. All right. And so, so they, they continued on Sunday. We'll talk about the results of that a little bit with, with, uh, the boldness that, that God puts in them and how they respond. We're going to talk about bold speech. And then the last uh, uh, part of our series on Sundays is going to be bold obedience. And uh, we've got some things for that, so it's going to be great. So, so here's what I want to do. I want to use a, a few of the phrases that we've talked about over the last several weeks just to remind you, plant them. If you haven't heard them, uh, write them down. If you have, just let it be a reminder, uh, you know, and check that off. Um, their response was from Sunday, bold prayers do what? Bold prayers, first of all, boldly proclaim who God is. They boldly proclaim who God is. And so they started there in Acts chapter four by praying, sovereign Lord. Okay, you're God all by yourself. Nobody made you God. Nobody voted you in. We can't vote you out. You're God all by yourself. Sovereign Lord, you made the heavens. You made the universe. You made everything in them. You fill them in every way. You're sovereign. Everybody say sovereign. And then they proclaimed or prayed God's word back to him. Okay, T- Paul wrote to Timothy and he said, every word of scripture is God breathed. And it's useful for training, for correction. How many glad that God corrects your course? Uh, the message translation says, that it reveals our rebellion. Ouch. But aren't you glad it gets revealed? See, and so he says, every word of God is breathed by the Holy Spirit and every word of God is useful. So when we take God's word and pray it back to him, it's not like he forgot it and so we're reminding him what he said and kind of making him keep his word. It's that now God's already breathed it. God's already anointed it. Now when we take it, and use it in our prayer by faith and pray it back to God, it's just multiplying the power and the effect of that word. Faith comes by hearing. Hearing what? The word of God. It doesn't say hearing it from somebody else. Faith can come in your heart by hearing it from your own lips. That, that when you're speaking it or you're reading it or you're praying it, especially to God, sometimes the, the spirit of God begins to pray through us things that we don't even know what to pray. Isn't that what Romans 8 says? And so here, as Peter's filled with the Holy Spirit, as the church is filled with the Holy Spirit, as as we're being led, spirit-led in prayer, God wants to work boldness in our lives. And so we talked about boldness proclaims who God is, then boldness proclaims what God says. In his word, it's not a historical document that that we go back, we're going to look at that in a minute, from uh, Habakkuk's prayer. That, that he didn't just use it and say, Lord, I've heard of you. I've heard of what you used to do. And sometimes when we come to the word of God, we approach it as a historical document, as factual evidence about what God used to do and who he used to be when he was really working in people's lives. And it's one of the greatest detriments to boldness and powerful prayer that we could have. That, that we, it's not who God was, it's who God is. And who he wants to be in our situation. Somebody say amen. Amen. All right. So here's what I want you to get tonight. Bold prayer is rooted in the character of God and the authority of his word. Bold prayer is rooted in the character of God, who he is, his nature, his character, how he's responded, how he's acted 
for generations from time beginning. What he did in the beginning and what he's going to keep doing past the end because God began the beginning and God ends the end and then God starts a new beginning because God never ends. God always was. And so there's no time limit on our prayers because there's no time limit with God. And he understands our heart and he understands who we are and he knows that we're but dust. Boldness, we said in the beginning, was behavior that was born out of belief. Be, 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 be. Too many B words in the same sentence. Boldness is behavior that's born out of belief. In other words, you can't act contradictory to what you believe. You can be an imposter, you can put on a front, you can do whatever for a while, but it's not real. People see right through it. And nowhere is that more evident than in prayer. I've been in environments where people have prayed real loudly. But it was not bold, it was obnoxious. Because what they said may have been true, but they didn't believe it. Are you with me here? And then I've heard some of the most bold, powerful prayers that, that were prayed through tears and uh, the awkwardness of runny noses and whatever. I was praying with a guy at an altar one time and his nose was running and it just kept, I know it's gross, but it was powerful as well. Just the fact that how, how much emphasis do we place on, you know, having it all together? And yet he, here he was with, it didn't matter. And, and, you know, those awkward times where you're, you don't even know that your nose is running or your hair's messed up or whatever. You, you forgot to put one earring on or whatever. That's always my big deal. I always make sure, hun, do I have both earrings in this morning before I go to church? And she's, you're good. So that's a joke. And so understanding that uh, here and talking about bold prayer, what I want us to see is the results that they experienced or what God wants us to experience. Because boldness wasn't just a result of the, the church being born and, and everything was new and going. It was a result of the Holy Spirit filling their lives and flowing out of them with this boldness, taking a stand against opposition and threats and uh, th being thrown in jail and being falsely accused and all that kind of thing. All right? And so God wants to work in our lives in that way. So here's the thing I said Sunday. Uh, God honors bold prayer because bold prayer honors God. Uh, Pastor Mark Batterson said that, but I stole it. Bold prayer honors God, and God honors bold prayer because it honors Him. In other words, what we believe is how we behave. In prayer, what we believe is revealed in what we ask for, in what we say to God and about God. Okay? In other words, bold prayer is not, God, where are you? Bold prayer is not, Lord, if you'd only been here, as Mary and Martha said, our brother wouldn't have died, but you weren't. You were late and he died and it's your fault. That's what they were saying. That wasn't a bold prayer. That was a whiny prayer because they didn't understand. And Jesus here not only meets them at this point of compassion and tells them, listen, if you believe... You, you, you'll, you're going to see the dead raised. He, he who believes in me will live even if he dies. And they're like, what? And then Jesus gets to Lazarus' tomb and he, and he cries. Why? Because he's moved with compassion for our needs. All right, he, he's in the environment, he's in the moment, and he understands that, but as well, and then the people look, oh, look how much he loved him. He's crying too. He, he was really close to him. And Jesus was praying and here's his prayer. Father, I thank you that you hear me. And I thank you that you always hear me. Now, if you're getting ready to raise somebody from the dead, I'm just saying, you may be bold, but I'm betting you're praying a little bit longer than that. And then he just stands up and calls Lazarus forth and Lazarus comes forth and it's like another day at work. Next. And then later on, they want to kill Lazarus because... Jesus raised him from the dead. Talk about not being able to win for losing. It's like, look, I didn't do anything. I was dead. And, and, and just because you're dead doesn't mean it's time to quit. Lazarus didn't. 
Jesus didn't give him a choice. Lazarus, come forth. I'm good. Look, it's nicer on this side. And when God's got a purpose, even death can't stop it. Can you say amen to that? All right, and so here's what I want us to do. Would you flip back to the, the book of Habakkuk? Test your Bible knowledge. True confession. I didn't learn the books of the Bible because I didn't grow up in church. I didn't learn the books in the Bible until I was in uh, Bible college, and I had to for a test. And I didn't know there were 66 of them. And so uh, I'm a pretty sharp guy, but I don't think like other people. And so I couldn't get Habakkuk. I I couldn't get it in the sequence. And so when I was first reading through it, I thought, that's just... I don't understand what that means. And so I, I would make up little things to help me memorize it. And so for years, I'd have to pause when I said Habakkuk because when I memorized the books of the Bible, the way I could mem- remember Habakkuk was, hey, back up. So it was always, hey, back up to me. So turn to the book of, hey, back up. And uh, y- you might find Micah and then back up from there. And so not Micah, Micah, but Micah in the Bible. All right, so here, here Habakkuk is a prophet that God speaks to. Probably the most famous part of Habakkuk is where God speaks to him about vision in chapter two. And he tells him to write the vision and make it plain so that a herald could run with it who reads it because the vision waits for an appointed time. And though it tarry, he's to wait for it because it will come true and will not prove false. Okay, and that's accurate, but it's even more powerful when you put it in context. That, that basically Habakkuk is a short book of, that he records the revelation that God gives him, but it starts with him complaining. Actually, Habakkuk can be summarized as two complaints and a prayer, which is very similar to a lot of believers' prayer lives in general. That, that they spend more time, twice as much time complaining as they do praying. I know that's not you. I'm just saying those other people that are at some other church tonight. All right. And so, so he gives these complaints. Here's what I want us to see how powerful it is. God's able to handle your hard questions. In fact, uh, I wish I could share. I don't have liberty to do so because I didn't ask, but it, we have a great... Uh, group on Monday night, small group, we've been meeting together, and one of the guys was sharing Monday night, very honestly, about walking through a tremendously difficult time, and he got very angry at God. He's not an angry man. Very angry at God. And he said, I called God names. I, I said stuff to God that, that I should never say. And, and he said, I, I'm serious. I, I was throwing stuff and and just, I was just letting God have it. And he said, it must have been 20 minutes. And he said, then I sat down in this swing, and he said, I was exhausted. And I was crying, and I was still angry. And the Lord just very gently said, are you finished? Didn't rebuke him. Didn't say, oh yeah, well I got some names for you, buddy. And I remember the times when you sinned, I got a record of them. See, how powerful is that? And we just think, you know, that we got to do all this when in our heart, we don't know what to do with all the emotion and all the junk that's there. And we have these questions and we why Habakkuk did and God didn't kill him. In fact, he asked why. Maybe it's a very pertinent question for us because the first complaint that Habakkuk had to God was, I see violence without justice. Why? Anybody see the news? Okay, now we got the Boston Marathon. We got innocent people with their legs blown off. We got an eight-year-old child that's killed for senseless stupidity, violence without justice. When when the, the scripture says there's nothing new under the sun, let me tell you, terrorism is nothing new. That they've been dealing with that since. God said, this is your land. There are some folks living there. They're going to take care of it for a while, but we're going to drive them out. Okay, and this whole aspect of terrorism is nothing new. But how do we handle it? Great question. 
Because Habakkuk starts with that complaint. God, how long will I cry violence, violence, and you don't respond? How long will wicked men rule and there's no justice? They're not repaid for their actions. And, and so he goes on and, and he shares that with God. Here's what the Lord says. Look and be amazed. In fact, God said, watch and you will be utterly amazed. I'm about to do something in your day that you wouldn't believe even if I told you which I think is very interesting because God's telling him. He said, you wouldn't believe it even if I told you, and I'm telling you, and you don't believe it. In other words, here he is saying, Lord, I see all this stuff around me, and he's looking at what's going on around him, and there's all this violence, but there's no justice. That the people don't have to pay for those actions, and it just doesn't seem right. And this very unsure, very uncertain, this violent society, and he's crying out to God, but he's doing it with this voice of complaint. And God handles it very well. And he simply responds and says, you ain't going to believe it when it happens. But I'm going to do something in your day, in your day, in your time, not in the future. And not to, well, you know, remember when I, was, when I was really powerful and created the whole universe in six days? Remember that? God's not taking us back to what he used to do. God wants to do something in your life today, tonight. God wants to respond. And the way he gets us to respond and opens the door to work in our life is not just hearing our complaints, but getting us to a place to embolden us in prayer. And so when, we, when he starts, his first complaint was, Lord, there's violence without justice. His second complaint, uh, in the middle part of chapter one there, is uh, that God said, here's what I'm gonna do. I'm gonna raise up the Babylonians and I'm gonna send them in to bring judgment on the nation to turn their hearts back to me. And, and Habakkuk says, his second complaint was, God, you can't use them. You ever tell God who he can use and who he can't? You can't use ungodly people to do righteous stuff. You, you can't use, they don't even like you. They, God, they're against you. It's, in fact, it says they have their own God, and they seek their own honor. That, that they're so wrapped up in themselves, they don't even have time for you. You can't use them. To which God responds, okay, you need to write this down. Write this revelation and make it plain. Write it on a tablet because it will prove true. It will not tarry. Though it does, you wait for it. But you need to make sure that the vision I give you, what I open to you in the spirit, in other words, God's beginning to, to bring boldness into his heart by speaking to him through the spirit with dreams and revelations. Okay, opening this up for him to, to see a vision. Everybody with me here? Yes or no? Okay, and so he says, it will surely come to pass. It will not prove false. Though it linger, Wait for it. Any, anybody else love that waiting word? Yeah. We, we went to Sam's today. Yeah. And I was really frustrated, and we weren't even parked yet. I know. I backslid. So I promised I wouldn't go back to Babylon, I mean Sam's or Walmart parking lot. And, and so Kim was very gracious, and we were walking through the store, and I was still pretty frustrated, and so we got to the checkout deal, and we're there. And of course, you know what happens? R right, right when I'm calming down a little bit, the lady has 74 items, and she wants to pay for them separately. And she has one part, she's got dog food that she wanted to pay for separately, and then she had this stuff she wanted to pay for separately. And I'm looking, going, five minutes, five minutes, five minutes, five minutes. Hot dog. Just kidding. And, and so I'm thinking, here we go. Here we go. So Kim says, is this testing your patience? <laughs> then she said, but you're doing so good. And I'm thinking, and you're lying so big right now. So I don't know which is worse, me backsliding or you lying and backsliding. But so, so we're going through, and of course, 
then, then the lady not only does that and divides all the stuff up, but then she said, wait, you, you rang that up twice. And so the lady said, no, I didn't. Yes, she did. No, I didn't. Yes, she did. And I'm going, I'll buy it. How much is it? And so she made her take it off. And then she said, oh, yeah. Okay, we'll put that back on. And I'm like, lady, N knowing that this is the Lord, he's obviously working here. And there's going to be a great illustration for the message tonight of what God's doing. And so I'm like, okay, here, here, I don't know the point here, but all right, great. So she, she makes it all the way through. We pay for our stuff rapidly. The lady behind us smiled. So we're leaving. And who's in front of us? Yeah, sister divide my order up person. And when she gets to the checkout, she made the lady check to make sure all the stuff that she had just paid for that she checked and took, took off and put back on was actually in her cart. And I'm like, okay, I know I'm breaking protocol and this is probably a national security issue, but I'm going to leave Sam's without the mark on my receipt. Okay. So, so if you hear that I was in prison for 20 years because I didn't have a purple mark on my receipt, I think they were using orange today, uh, then, then that's fine. What does all that have to do with anything? You don't like to wait either. You thought I missed it. Okay, we hate that. And here God says, listen, this is going to happen. God is speaking faith or, or truth that's bringing faith in Habakkuk's heart. He's, he's showing him this vision, but he said, it's not for now, but it will come to pass. Though it tarry, wait for it. So he finishes. God tells him what's going to happen. Uh, he, he defines it. And then chapter three uh, of Habakkuk is where I want to look at just for a few minutes. And then we'll put this into practice. Okay. If, did you find it yet? I gave you all that time so, so that you could actually find Habakkuk if you don't know where it is. You can actually cheat and, and use the, the index in the front of your Bible. Or if you can't find it and you realize you only have a New Testament, you're probably out of luck at this point. So we'll, we'll, we'll put the scriptures on the screen for you as well. So Habakkuk here, after all, God lead him through this process, prays this prayer. And his prayer is this in chapter 3, verse 1. It says, a prayer of Habakkuk the prophet. And then on some difficult Bible word, which is a musical term. Sh 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 whatever that is. It's a, it's a dangerous Bible word that we won't say. Verse 2. Lord, I have heard of your fame. I stand in all of your deeds, O Lord. Renew them in our day. In our time, make them known in wrath, remember mercy. Lord, I have heard of your fame. Anybody ever get stuck there? I remember the good old days. I remember what you used to do. Lord, I've heard about you doing this for other people, but now it's not somebody else's need, it's yours. Now it's not somebody else's crisis, it's yours. Now it's not somebody else's house, your house. Not somebody else's kids, your kids. Not somebody else's issue, yours. Not somebody else's report, yours. Not their diagnosis, it's got your name on it. And so what you need is not a God who used to do those things or somebody that you've heard about. It, it, you need God to make himself real to you here and now, in this moment. Can somebody say Amen. Okay? We're talking about bold prayer. This is a bold prayer. Lord, I've heard of your fame. I have heard of your deeds, O Lord. Renew them in our day. Anybody ever want God to renew his contract with you? I mean, it's a covenant, but put it that way. God, can we renew the... It, it, did, did it expire? No, I just want to make sure it's fresh. I, I want to make sure we're covered. I, I just need you to work here. Right? If you get stuck in, in as reading Scripture as history, then faith doesn't work in your heart. And the enemy will bring condemnation and begin to undermine hope 
and cause you to struggle with doubt and unbelief and waver. And boldness says, like Habakkuk, Lord, I've heard of your fame. I remember your deeds. So renew them in our day. I don't want it to be yesterday's prayers, and I'm not living on yesterday's reputation. Lord, I need to know you, and I need to see you move here. Now, that's not being rude. That's not being disrespectful. That's not dishonoring toward God. In fact, it's honoring him that, that he's the God who's here. He's the God in the now. He's the one who's present in our life and, and wants to be. And so he, he simply prays that prayer. Lord, I've heard of your fame. I stand in all of your deeds. Oh, Lord, renew them in our day. In our time, make them known. And in wrath, remember mercy. Why would he say that? Because God said, I'm going to use the Babylonians to bring judgment. I'm not mad at them, but I'm using the enemy to turn their hearts toward me. And so Habakkuk's processing all that. God explains it to him, and he prays his prayer. And so we talked about, okay, remember Acts 4? Let's make the connection here to bold prayer. Bold prayer does two things. Remember what it is? Bold prayer says who God is. Bold prayer then says what? What God says. Bold prayer is rooted in the character of God, and it's also rooted in the authority of Scripture. Now watch. Habakkuk says, Lord, I understand the Scripture, and I understand your fame and, and, and your reputation and your character and who you are, but I need it now. I need it in our day. I need it in our time. And so then he spends 13 verses talking about the glory of God, the power of God, the majesty of God, all that God is and how he works. We wouldn't take time to read all those. Okay, verse three through verse 16. It's all about God's majesty, God's power, that when he spoke, the mountains shook and crumbled and the age-old hills collapsed and his ways are eternal and on and on. God's nature, God's character. 13 verses, two verses of prayer. Lord, I've heard of your fame. I've heard of your deeds. Renew them on our day. Make them known in our time. 13 verses over and over and over and over and over again. God's word, God's power, God's methods, God's means, what God did, how God created, all of that. And then he comes to verse 17 and he says, uh, or excuse me, verse 16, I heard and my heart pounded. My lips quivered at the sound. Catch the picture here, folks. Decay crept into my bones and my legs trembled. What, what, what's going on? A little emotional, a little intense. Uh, I, I, I heard that, and I heard what I was saying. I, I heard in my spirit what God was speaking to me. And, and so my lips started quivering, and, and my heart started pounding, and decay started creeping into my bones. In other words, I felt like I was going to faint. My legs trembled. Yet I will wait patiently for the day of calamity to come on the nation invading us. Not just on us. Yeah, I don't tell you what, I, this is, we're all going to hell in the handbasket and just got, just, if you don't straighten up, God's going to get you. It's not what he's praying. He said, yet I will wait patiently for God to bring vengeance, God to bring justice on the nation invading us. Because God's not going to turn on his people. That would be against his nature and against his character. And so here, he, he's reminding himself of that, and the intensity of that is, is causing him to be emotional, causing him to be powerful, and he says, all right, yet I'm going to wait patiently for God to answer this prayer, verse 17, though the fig tree does not bud, though there are no grapes on the vines, though the olive crop fails, the fields produce no fruit, there are no sheep in the pen and no cattle in the stalls. Yet, I will rejoice in the Lord. I will be joyful in God my Savior. The sovereign Lord is my strength. Not was, not will be, is my strength. He makes my feet like the feet of a deer. He enables me to go on the heights. And then he says, 
for the director of music on my stringed instruments, and he reveals that this isn't just a prayer, it's a song. Here's what I want you to see. One word can make all the difference. He'd already complained twice. God, there's violence all around me with no justice. God, I don't understand why you want to use ungodly people to, to, to do godly things. You can't use them. God answered both complaints. Now he prays a prayer. And he doesn't turn it into a complaint because he spends a lot more time glorifying God and his power and his majesty than he does talking about ain't got nothing to eat, ain't got nothing blooming, ain't got nothing growing, ain't got nothing walking, ain't got nothing. Turn to somebody and say, I got nothing. See, have you ever felt like that? It's like, okay, I want to look for something to have faith and you know, faith without works is dead. And, you know, I want to look for a little fruit. And, you know, even Elijah sent the guy out seven times and at least he saw a cloud the size of a man's hand. You got to be looking real hard to find that. I think he made it up. Regardless, we look for something to think, is God even here? Is God moving? Is this working? Is, does he hear my prayer? And so in the midst of that, he said, I got nothing. There are no buds on the olive trees if they, or the fig trees, if they don't bud, if they don't have blooms, then they'll never have fruit. That's why Jesus, when he was walking by the fig tree and he lifted the leaves to find out if there were any blooms and he cursed the fig tree because he knew it wasn't going to have fruit. We're like the fig tree. Jesus didn't come to curse us. He came to bless us and so we could be ever fruitful. And he realizes that if there's no evidence of that, then there's not going to be any fruit. And so here Habakkuk says, though, though the fig tree isn't even blooming. In other words, that, no figs this year. So then he goes to the olives. Then he goes to the grapes. Then he goes to the fields. And then he goes to the livestock. And he got nothing. There isn't any. I have Nothing. No evidence of blessing, nothing of what you promised. Yet. Y E T. Yet. Bold prayers are yet prayers. Bold prayers are not yet. Is God moving? What's God doing? Seeing God move? You healed? You free? You feel better? Is pain gone? Not yet. That's not faithless. That's a yet prayer. That's a bold prayer. Did, did you get the money? Did it come in? Well, well, I thought you said you needed it by Tuesday. Well, it's Wednesday. Is it there? Not yet. See, what do you say? I don't see anything. There's no promise of that. There's no harvest. There's no income. There's no food. There's no wine nor hope for any, yet will I rejoice in Him. Can you rejoice in the answer to your prayer before it comes? A unique word. He didn't say, I will hope for it. He said, I will rejoice in it. The next line and I will joy in God my Savior. Very interesting word. It's the Hebrew word gil, G-I-L. So I thought of gil. Only it's pronounced gil, G-E-E-L, gil. Hebrew word joy or rejoice. Very descriptive word. Doesn't just mean to feel happy in your heart. It, it means to dance, to leap, to jump and spin at the same time. It literally means to twirl around with an intense motion. I would display that for you, but I would have vertigo for about four days. 
I want you to get that picture because not only does God say, here Habakkuk says, I don't see any fruit of that, but I'm not going to get discouraged. I'm not going to be despondent. I'm not going to think, oh, great, what are we going to do next month? And then what are we going to do after that? And how are we going to make it through the winter? And if we don't have any, any meat, how, how are we going to do that? And how are we going to have, well, I don't have what we're going to feed the kids and all that kind of thing. I mean, there's nothing. Yet I will joy, I will rejoice. I'll jump, I'll leap, I'll spin around intensely. I, I will display the same reaction as if God already answered the prayer. Bold prayers are yet prayers. So let me ask you a question. Instead of confessing that you believe the answer, are you willing to joy the answer? Are you willing to rejoice in the answer boldly before you see it? Are you willing to, to, to have the same uh, emotion and intensity as if God delivered on the promise and he delivered the grapes and he delivered the figs and he delivered a truckload of cattle and he delivered a little sheep into your pastures and they went running around and kicking and bucking like little sheeps and, and lambs and calves do? Are you willing to... See, because boldness is that aspect that taps in to what God is doing and what God has spoken. And as we speak it to him, it's not based on the evidence that we see and what we can make happen. It's based on what only he can do. And so when he's talking about in those 13 verses in between that God cuts the earth with rivers and, and that God displays his power and that when God speaks and when God moves, the entire earth shakes, he's just reminding himself of the character and the nature of God. And then he looks around at the reality of the situation and he prays an honest prayer, which is a bold prayer, but an honest prayer. And he says, I got nothing. I got no fruit. I got no blooms. I got no hope. I got no cattle. I got no sheep. There's nothing in the fields. I got nothing. Anybody ever feel like you're standing out in the middle of a barren field thinking, man, I would just wish there was some grass here. Okay, just a skinny cow, anything, a goat. But we got nothing. But listen, when we have nothing and we realize our God and in him, our rejoicing in him, we have everything. Not only he says, will I rejoice in God, but I will rejoice and I will joy in God my Savior. I got nothing and I got no way out. Even if I got the hiccups, God will heal us. God will set us free. <laughs> that was funny. That was good too, wasn't it? I'm right back on track. That, that God will be our Savior. Listen, if he doesn't come through, there's nothing we can do. What's, what's he really praying here? What's the, the, project the end of the prayer. Father, uh, I'm either going to starve to death or you're going to save me because I got nothing. Now, question is not whether you can use your final breath to tell God how good he is and that he's been faithful and you're dying now and you're going to come to see him real soon. The question is, can you rejoice outwardly before you see the answer come? Because he says, not only will I rejoice, I'll, I'll demonstrate it. I'll jump. I'll leap. I'll dance. I'll, I'll turn around with an intense motion. I'll twirl in God because he's more than enough and then he says God you're you're my strength you're my shield you're the one who's there now, now put that in perspective you think it's kind of a strange route to bold prayer not really because number one it's Bible it's the scriptures and God could have chose any stories to put in there. He could have chose any prophet to record, but he chose Habakkuk. He chose to put in his honest words. He chose to include his complaints along with his prayer of faith and his confession. He, he chose to display the difficult things and the good things. 
He chose to display his power and he chose to display Habakkuk's question and his concern and all of that. He told him to write it down and make it plain, make a record of it because people need to see it and understand clearly the vision that God was going to do. But he also told him that, that he could have that aspect of rejoicing in God outwardly before he felt uh, the, the joy inwardly, so to speak. We're not just talking about some, some deal that's there that we, we just feel. That's what we kind of try to explain away, but it's not. Do you know God uses the same term about himself in Isaiah 65, 19? And he said, I will dance and twirl and rejoice and leap over you. He, he said, I'm going to come and I'm going to take away all the questions, all the violence, all the complaint, all the stuff. There's not going to be anything to complain about. Little children aren't going to die early and old people aren't going to uh, miss a day of their lives that, that I'm going to be there. But in the midst of that, God will rejoice over us at that time, not just us. And didn't just say, I'm going to be real happy on the inside, but I'm God and I don't want to get carried away. Here's the interesting thing for you. Do you know what the Hebrew term for strength is? Intriguing. Oz. Oz. Seriously. O-Z. Oz. And, and there's one passage where he, he says, my strength and my fortress, and literally in the Hebrew, it is the, the word Uzi, Maha Uzi. Uh-huh. Strength. That, take that gun control, people. I just thought it was interesting. Oz, the great and powerful. <laughs> strength. The Hebrew term for strength is Oz. I don't know where, if that's where they got it or, or not, but hey, it's there. It's true. And, and so here, here's what I want to leave you with tonight, and then I want us to pray. One of my favorite quotations from Eugene Peterson, uh, he writes very honestly about pastoral work, and he says one of his big pet peeves in pastoral work and in pastoring and and being in community is when a gathering will take place, whatever, of people, and they'll look and say, hey, Rev, will you get us started with a little prayer? Hey, hey Pastor, get us, get us started with a little prayer, will you? And he says he hates that term. And he says it would be wonderful if we as pastors would counter by bellowing out William McNamara's fantasized response, no, I will not. Because there are no little prayers. Prayer enters the lion's den and brings us before the holy God, whether it is uncertain if we will even come back alive or sane. For it is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of a living God. No, I will not pray a little prayer. Hey, I want to tell you that a prayer of faith, as small as a mustard seed, is not a little prayer either. A prayer that you see as weak, of running to God, running away from an enemy, is a bold statement and confession of what God has for you, of what God wants, that he's connecting you with a place of faith in his nature and in his word because he wants to bring a response in your heart. Before you see the answer, he wants to give you the strength to rejoice in it, and he wants to have you find your strength in him, not your strength, in getting a need met because sometimes we don't even know what to ask for. But God's nature in his wisdom and his care for us is even when we don't know what to ask for and pray as we ought to pray, the Spirit himself prays through us and he connects with the perfect will of God because he is God. Come on, when we're talking about bold prayer, it doesn't mean we feel bold while we're praying it. It's not a bold feeling it's a bold prayer. And a bold prayer like the song we sang tonight is coming to God saying, Lord, I need you in those times of temptation. What, what did God say to Paul? When, when you're weak, my strength is perfected. I'm not advocating a theology of weakness. I'm saying God understands your weakness and you'll never master his strength. So he gives it to you. He, he doesn't say be strong like me. He said, come to me and be strong. He didn't say, go hide and hope the enemy doesn't find you. He said, let me be a hiding place. I'll hide you and there's no way he can find you. 
He, he didn't say, make your house a fortress and get in a secure place. He said, let me be the secure place. I am a fortress. My name is a strong tower. It's a fortress against the enemy. Come on, I'm speaking that to you tonight because I want that word to connect with you and, and boldness to begin to rise up because I think every person here has some areas like Habakkuk experience that we ain't seeing it. Maybe it is the fact that as you watch the coverage of the Boston Marathon or you see events that just don't make sense and don't work right, and God, we see violence without justice and, and I don't like it. Maybe we see like uh, Rick Warren, as you followed that, whose son battled mental illness for years and depression and, and they, they took him to the best people and best hospitals and he was on treatment and yet just last week ended up taking his life. Pastor's conference down in Jacksonville today, they Skyped him in and he was there live talking about receiving and how warm it was to receive their prayers and what a blessing it was for he and his family, but at the same time, he said, why can't we unify in outreach and proclaiming the name of the Lord like we unify in times of grief? It, it's comforting to me. It's a blessing to my family. But the world needs to see that when we come together, it's a powerful force. I love that. That's bold. That's strong. In a time of weakness, personally, there's boldness that's there. Come on, are you hearing that? Because sometimes we think we got to say it right, do it right, get the equation right, whatever, see God move, and it's just, it's going to be an instant thing. I love it when it's instant, except if it's coffee. See, so, so just make sure you understand what you're asking for. And sometimes when I come to prayer, and, and it's bold, and I feel the Spirit of God, and I speak those words, I want it to be instant. But I don't want it to be bitter like the instant coffee and think, man, that, that, that didn't cut it. That, that didn't meet it. And my term for now is different than God's term for now. But it doesn't mean God doesn't care. doesn't mean that God's not there. doesn't mean that God can't do it. doesn't mean I need to give him an out or I need to make up an excuse. We don't need to apologize for God. What we need to do is stand boldly and proclaim, even if I don't see it, and I don't see the buds, and I don't see the hope, and I don't see the fruit, and I don't see the calves, and the sheep, and the whatever, yet will I rejoice in Him, because the joy of the Lord is my strength. Father, we thank You for that tonight. And I thank You for every person standing in a place where they need to see You move. Lord, they need to see beyond empty fields and stalls and what they don't have and w what they're not expecting to, to who they do have and what they can expect in you. And Lord, I pray that you would meet us here tonight as we lift our voices boldly in prayer for these last few minutes and just find that place in you. Father, we would realize how, how the boldness motivated and that it would rise up within us. And we would declare, yet will I praise you. Yet will I find my strength in you. In Jesus' name. I just want you to listen for just a second. Here, here's just a list. When they said they, they prayed for boldness. Here's a list just in the book of Acts. Of, of prayer. In various places that God responded to. They prayed for God to show them who would replace Judas. In Acts chapter 1, they laid hands on the sick and prayed for healing. God met them there. Peter got down on his knees and prayed for Tabitha in Acts chapter 9. They fasted and prayed in Acts chapter 13. They preached that people should pray in Acts chapter 2. They had visions during prayer in Acts chapter 9 and Acts chapter 13. They knelt and prayed on a beach. They prayed on a roof. They prayed for those without Christ. God sent Saul to Ananias who was praying in Acts the, the church prayed in Acts chapter 12 again as they were imprisoned and threatened. They met in homes to pray. They worshiped and prayed in prison at midnight while they were in stocks and chains. Stephen prayed for the Lord to receive his spirit as he was dying for him to forgive. They prayed for people to receive the Holy Spirit in Acts chapter 8. They prayed for Dorcas to be raised from the dead and she was. 
They prayed with a boldness because God answered their prayer for boldness. Sometimes in weakness, sometimes in threat, sometimes in prison, sometimes in rejoicing, sometimes in groups, and sometimes alone. How about you? What, what do you need to face? And what do you need to declare? Lord, I don't see it. But tonight I'm making a bold choice to rejoice in you, to respond in you, to let my faith be worked out, not just held in. And Father, to release it to you, to leave the responsibility to you because you can well handle it and just lift my voice again and say, Father, here's what I need. Here's what I see. Here's how I understand it. Here's what I'm wrestling with. Here's where I am. Would you do that tonight? Come on, heads bowed, eyes closed all over. Would, would you just make it personal? Build an altar right there in your heart. We're just going to take these last five minutes and uh, just pray. Are you going to play? Or Okay, we can do that. And would you just start right where you are? Just build an altar right there in your heart. Come on, would you just lift it to the Lord? Aaron, would you just play something for us? Or just meet us right there. Father, we thank you for it. Right now, I pray in every point of discouragement, every question that we've had, the whys, the why nots, the whens, the how. Even understanding what. Lord, for the disappointment, through the pain, through the loss, through the misunderstanding, through all the stuff that life throws at us, piles on us, in the violence, the injustice, when it seems like people get by with it, seems like nobody has to pay, seems like justice isn't being done, righteousness isn't being worked, when it seems like it's totally out of control, it is out of our control. It's never out of yours. And so, Father, I pray that the strength that comes within would be calm and sure and steady and powerful. But the response would be anything but. Lord, I pray that, that just like Habakkuk, when someone hears you speaking into their situation tonight and into their heart, their lips would tremble they would become weak. Their knees would shake. They would be overwhelmed at, at, at what you're doing, the power, the presence of God within them. They would determine as well, Lord, to rejoice openly, to spin wildly, to leap as high as they can, to turn around and to rejoice as David danced before the Lord with all of his might with all of his strength. Father, I pray that we would rejoice boldly in the answer to our prayer before we see it. No, it is not presumption. It is total confidence born out of boldness in the nature of God who does not fail, who cannot lie, who's never late, who's always on time, who has more wisdom than we can fathom, whose power we could never fully grasp, and so, Lord, we have not because we ask not. And so tonight I pray that it's not asking again. It's not apologizing in the asking. It's letting boldness rise up and asking out of that same spirit that stirs within us. Father, the word that we heard tonight causes faith to rise in our heart, which causes us to speak the word that we know, the word that we've heard, that we've heard of your fame, we've heard of your deeds, we've heard of your power, we've heard of your glory, but Father, we need to see it. We need to see it in our day, we need to see it in our lives, we need to see it in our home, we need to see it in our marriages, we need to see it in our physical bodies, we need to see it in our children, we need to see it in a generation, we need to see it in our churches, we need to see it in our day, so renew them. Father, renew the deeds, renew the miracles, renew those things in our day and in our time. Make your power known, we pray, O oh Lord, in Jesus' name. Now for these last few minutes, I want you just to connect with somebody right there around you, if you would. 
The only thing that multiplies our boldness is not God being any bigger, it's just Him revealing Himself. It's us knowing more of His Word, not the volume or the, the information, but Him just revealing uh, uh, one scripture, one point to us, but then coming to a place of agreement, connecting with somebody else, hearing them pray, re- releasing that same spirit in, in groups of two or three, uh, and letting God work in us there. So would you just make little prayer groups right there around you if you want to stand up or connect with a couple of folks? And let's just lift our voices to the Lord here just for a couple of minutes before we go tonight. Let's pray prayers of agreement. Let's connect around that. Let's let God just speak to us and move mightily in our lives. Can we? Come on, let's pray for one another. Pray prayers of agreement. Jesus' name.